Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we're excited to have you here today to talk about winter kill recovery. I'm Bill Kreiser with uh, Greenkeeper. Joined with Zach Riker. Zach Riker with Bear Environmental Science. Yep, uh, we're excited to be here to talk about green or uh, winter kill recovery. You may not be excited to be here talking about winter kill recovery. Um, you know, at first we thought it was just isolated to Nebraska, and then we've been hearing more and more reports that it's more widespread. So when we were working together at the University of Nebraska eight years ago now, yep. we, uh, we'd started a bunch of different research projects and some things that Zach was doing even before uh, he, I arrived at the University of Nebraska. So we wanted to kind of fly through some quick, what should we be doing to recover? So we'll talk a little bit about how things are, uh, what's going on here? Someone's right on their slides. Um, <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about uh of, of why things happen, but we'll really focus on the recovery. Uh, hopefully it'll be quick, so there'll be time for, for any questions you might have. We do have the chat box going. We're gonna have this recorded so that um, if, you, if people can't make it, they can watch it later. So feel free to, uh, to do a chat box. And uh, if you need to uh, unmute yourself and ask a question at the end, we'll be able to do that too, because of how this, this meeting is set up. So yeah, feel, uh, feel free to use the chat box. because we have, we have an hour allotted, but we probably only have 35, 40 minutes of uh, uh, Bill and I chatting. So uh, please use the mute box. Uh, we're here to serve. And if it goes longer than an hour, uh, we're more than welcome to hang on and ask, uh, 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 answer individual questions that you might not want to uh, uh, ask in front of the group. Yep. So, all right, well, let's get started. So um, this is 2022 winter kill. These are pictures from 2014 when we had really widespread desiccation throughout the temperature kill in Nebraska. And we're seeing a lot of it again this year. Um, there's different forms of winter kill out there. Snow mold is obvious uh, to people that deal with constant snow cover. Uh, and that can be lethal, especially the gray snow mold. Ice encasement is always an issue. Toxic gas buildup and, and lack of oxygen from that suffocating clear uh, ice that doesn't have a lot of air pockets in it. Uh, but we're seeing a lot this year, it seems like, are different forms of low temperature injury. And so we have two different flavors, I guess. You have uh, when your crowns are, are too wet um, or if the crowns get too dry, the plant gets more susceptible to death from a rapid change in temperature from warm to cold. Um, and so I think a lot of people are familiar with the crown hydration part. Uh, in the Great Plains, we're thinking also about desiccation. And this is all because when the crown moistures are either too wet or too dry, we can form ice inside the, uh, the, uh, the plants that become lethal. So we do know that a lot of the death that we're probably seeing recently likely happened fairly recently. Um, this is some older research that's still cited a lot. This is from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, where they looked at cold hardiness of ryegrass and bentgrass. And so the temperature here is the temperature in which you would need to get to for the grass to actually die. So we can see ryegrass, uh, it has peak cold hardiness in January, uh, and it would die somewhere around 15, 20 below uh, zero Fahrenheit. And the bank grass could be as cold as 50 or more below Fahrenheit before it dies. Uh, but that's at peak hardiness. And so this hardiness increases all winter long. And then what we see is in uh, late January through early March, the hardiness really rapidly starts to become lost for both species. So we get some to March and April, uh, even going to zero degrees Fahrenheit can be lethal to both of these, these plants. And so we can lose hardiness two different ways. One is you get moisture there, so that's that crown hydration, or if we're pushing green up with fertilizer, uh, mowing, that can uh, lead to this lack of hardiness. Uh, heat from the sun uh, can help to great, uh, break uh, that, that, that dormancy response. And then finally, if we have very dry conditions, again, that the plant starts to be a little desiccated and it's more susceptible to cold that way. And on, on, this, uh, on this particular graph, we don't, uh, annual bluegrass is not on there, but I would predict annual bluegrass would be well above the perennial ryegrass line. Yep. Or maybe not well above it, but certainly uh, has less cold tolerance. Uh, than the perennial ryegrass, especially late in the winter. And we're seeing that right now, right? Because yeah. all the annual bluegrass is really starting to get growing. Yeah. So that means that it's wearing its hardiness off really quick. That's part of its growth habit. And so even though annual bluegrass might actually be fairly cold hardy or better in December and early January, it's not the same now. And so this is where, and unfortunately, yeah. the big temperature changes. Yeah. And all of this, and uh, everything that we're going to talk about today is without traffic. And so a lot of us, especially on public courses, 
you know, uh, you know, you got got to get when the getting is good. We had good temperatures uh, throughout most, much of the nation, and so we had a bunch of, of play uh, during the winter, a lot of cart traffic, and that's just going to exaggerate uh, declines in cold hardiness and survival. Yeah. So there is this kind of idea. We know this well that during the fall, the reason we see this increase in hardiness is because. The crown moisture, which is about 75 to 85 percent um, in the season, starts to decline as the days get shorter, nights get cooler. And that decline in crown moisture down to about 60, 55 percent, somewhere in that ratio, leads to the biggest spike in hardiness. And then when we get later into the winter, um, this is, again, older data, 50-year-old data, shows that the, the crown moisture starts to rise. And as that rise happens... Uh, we see the, uh, the loss of hardiness and it goes in um, a different direction too, where uh, again, if the crown moisture continue to drop below 50%, we also can see a loss of that hardiness. So there really is this kind of continuum of crown moisture in which the crown moisture between 50 and 65% is uh, going to pr produce the most winter hardiness, cold hardiness for any species. So for rye and bluegrass, that might be annual bluegrass, that might be, you know, can tolerate 15 below. But if it starts to hydrate um, or continue to dehydrate, we lose the hardiness. And so the plant again. starts to have problems. Jesus. Hey, folks, uh, if you can, make sure your, your microfilm's muted. We got, I uh, can't quite figure out who's doing the uh, talking back there, but please, if you can, mute the microphones. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. So thatch is also a big issue for this, especially from the desiccation. Uh, those crowns are elevated. They're more susceptible to being dried out. And then they're also more susceptible to big temperature changes. And so we do see a lot of thatchier areas, bank grass at say um, uh, fairway or tea height, especially uh, versus a non top dress green. They seem to, to bear the brunt of this desiccation uh, stress. So if you're in there, this world now where you're fearing this winter kill, what should you do? Well, one of the things we can do is we can pull plugs to see if they're alive. Take a cup cutter. You can eat a hole saw if the ground's still frozen. I guess most people, that's not the case anymore. Put them inside, warm them up. But just know if you have very severe cold injury, either from desiccation or from possibly crown hydration, uh, it can take a while to, to green up, especially if it's desiccation. It might take two to three weeks to see any kind of regrowth. And so this can be helpful to tell your board, like, yes, we have plugs that are, we have death at, but we shouldn't wait for this because you know, you're putting yourself three, four weeks behind the eight ball. Yeah. And so if you really think you have desiccation, wait a little bit, but don't rely solely on these plugs because Zach will show going too late is problematic. So if you did have winter kill, first question you should ask is why did it die? So you can think about what you should do this year to prevent it possibly next year. But more importantly now is if you think you have winter kill, formulate that plan. Buying seed, thinking about if there's drainage areas that need to get helped, if it's an ice death issue. Um, there's just uh, what, how are you going to fertilize? How are you going to cut the seed in? Get that plan made out so you can communicate that with your board of directors or your um, or your bosses so they know that you're doing something because doing nothing sometimes can look pretty bad. Yes. Yep. Got to do something. So we go out by seed, you know, and again, that depends, especially if you lost ryegrass, you went back ryegrass, that could be a challenge. It's going to be tough to find in um, most cases. There's bank grass out there, it sounds like, and the blue grasses. Uh, I know I bought some for, for a, par, a par three course. It might have some damage here or there. We're fortunately a little more protected in the center of city, but, you know, we have that seed on order so we can cut it in right away. Um, and just understand that there's going to be a lot of inherent difficulties, cold weather, changeable weather in the spring. We have diseases, we have root, uh, we have weed issues, and then ensuring seed the soil contact. So we really want to kind of focus on what are some ways to maximize the seeding. Yeah, and the, uh, the, the cold, the weather changes are probably going to be the worst for you. And then the other thing is, is trying to balance uh, growing, growing this turf back in and uh, allowing golf, allowing car traffic and all that. And that's, that's, that is, that's always the most difficult part of this whole thing. Yeah, exactly. You know, you're sitting there, can we, should we start mowing right away at, at 120 or less on Greens Heights? Um, what, what's the best route of uh, plan of action there is something we were constantly trying to figure out. So 
the first thing we want to do is if we think we have dead grass, instead of just waiting for those plugs, uh, seed, seed, seed. If you are a Paul Anya golf course, sometimes the best thing to do is just cultivate. Yep. Just yep. Pull that seed up. And in um, the research plots is what we do all the time. Yeah. We actually round it up, round up areas, and then we just disturb the soil and let the POA just germinate. Um, the best thing you can do sometimes with POA is just let it come back in. It's forget. It's that's the best thing about POA. It's really forgiving. It's it, uh, it's it's finicky, but at least it's forgiving. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going bentgrass, if you're going backhand with rye, or if you're, not, if you're going to move from maybe a rye fairway to a bluegrass or a bentgrass fairway, making sure we cut that seed in is really important. And we'll have some uh, info about that. Uh, you can sometimes use covers and pigments and they can help to warm the soil uh, in some cases. And sometimes they don't. We'll talk about that. Um, be really careful with aggressive fertilizer. Because you think you're helping things out now, but you can really be setting yourself up for problems in the middle of July. So that's something to, uh, to be aware of too. And then again, controlling those pests are gonna be really key to maximizing success of spring seeding. Oops. All right. Okay. So, you know, what happens if we do nothing? Um, the poa is probably going to come back. Um, other weeds can come in too with no herbicides. Um, you don't want to have any kind of pre-emergence down. I think one thing that I remember a lot from 2014 was people thought they saw some green up and they went out with their pre's yep. because they thought, hey, it's kind of greening up. But then maybe the crown was damaged in a way that it couldn't make roots. So you yeah. see some green there and then when it tried to make roots, it couldn't, it died. And then we had pre down and we were stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, pre, uh, just stay, uh, stay the heck away from pre-emerge herbicides right yep. now, unless it's going to be something like tenacity, uh, which allows you to seed into, uh, it's not that great of a pre-emergent herbicide uh, for general use, but just, just stick away, just avoid the, pre, the pre-emergent herbicides. And if you're trying to grow something back, whether it's a green or a fairway, uh, I would not, I would avoid growth regulators too. Uh, back in 2014, visited a zillion courses, Bill and I, between us, uh, every time we had problems with guys growing things back in, they were already on their growth regulator uh, sequence. Yeah. And it just, uh, I don't care what you're using, just avoid it. Yeah. Put the priority and get in the grass back in. And so especially our class B PGRs, you got to remember those are early jet barrel and inhibiting uh, PGRs, your trim it and your cutlass. Those can be taken up by the root and they will inhibit germination. So they also act as pre. So we don't want to have those there on top of what they can do to those little seedlings. What about proxy? You think I should be dealing with proxy? Yeah, I, I always, so proxy, uh, it's a great growth regulator for, uh, for seeds. It's not a very good regulator for growth and things like that, except at high rates. Uh, I look at the big picture. What's more important? You want grass there or do you want seed heads there? I think I'm going to pick grass. And it's the same thing with the pre's in general. Yeah. Right? Like we can always yeah. come back in with some post emergent yeah. options, but don't yeah. limit ourselves now. Yeah. If you're, again, if you, if you have, if you have 80% of your turf there, yeah. On, on a green, on a polar green, we'll say, yeah, I'd probably use proxy just to keep it, you know, keep it as smooth as putting as you can. But if you're at 50% or less, I probably would avoid uh, a proxy in that case. Yeah. It's, it's a priority thing. So we're going to irrigate then, get that POA growing. Uh, hollow time again, bring the seeds up. If you want to bring seed up, hollow time area. So that's yep. why we try to avoid yep. it in when we have healthy uh, grass there, especially in bent grass green. Um, but if you're going for the POA, that would be the best way to get that good seed yep. up. Yep. Um, you know, long term, is it really, uh, is it unsustainable to, to do this? You know, maybe if you are... Uh, trying to go away from the POA, but if you're in the East Coast and you love your POA greens, and this is one of the best things that we can do. Yeah, that's, that, again, that, that's a that's a bigger picture question uh-huh. that you're probably not gonna answer within the first, the next three weeks, uh, but a plan, is it is it really sustainable? In most cases, it's not, you know, when I worked at Purdue and worked uh, farther East, I was worried about POA in the summer with anthracnose and summer patch and pick your disease. But now uh, uh, moving out to the Great Plains, I've fully realized it's really a winter problem, yeah. truly a winter problem. And there's not much we can do during the winter to keep that stuff alive. And I'm going to say that you misspell unsustainable. I, I misspell, yep, I'll pick that. You always <laughs> see that once it's on the screen. Exactly. Yep. All right. There we go. All right. 
So for reseeding, thinking about the different species, uh, ryegrass availability is going to be a huge issue right now. Yeah. Uh, and then also, is it sustainable uh, in a place where we're seeing more open winters like in Nebraska, uh, a grass that when we have these big temperature swings is, is prone to problems, uh, we got to think, is this makes sense? If we lost our ryegrass in 2014 and again in 2022, uh, we just it's just a cycle we're, we're OK with. And, and, it, and, and but if we if we choose putting our grass, that's that's fine. But then you probably, you know, out here, you're probably going to have to make some changes to your winter irrigation. Yeah. Easy, which is way easier said than done. But, you know, uh, there's just there's just no way around it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're seeing that now a lot of courses tank watered this winter. And that's yeah. why a lot of the greens this year are better than yeah. 2014, because people remembered that year. Yeah. One of the challenges with going bluegrass is it's um, first of all for desiccation, it's great. It's rye bluegrass, so this could be an opportunity to move from a ryegrass fairway to one of these bluegrasses, knowing that some of them can be slow to germinate. But I would say some. But, uh, the issue that we always run with Kentucky bluegrass, it just is it's it's just a wimp as a as a seedling, and then we want to introduce ryegrass as a seedling. It's pretty tough. That's why we use it on sports fields all the time. Mm -hmm. But bluegrass is just kind of, yeah. it's just kind of a wimp, and so that gets back to this whole traffic thing. And there's no per, there's no perfect there's no perfect grass, you know, depending on availability. Just I mean, in this case, it green might be good. Yeah, and and Caribbean bent grass, you know, that can be a good one. It, it, a lot of the newer varieties, like we've gone to newer varieties, are a lot more disease and drought tolerant. Um, they have great cold tolerance. Yeah, yeah, as long as they don't get wet or dry. As long as they don't get. And dry. then so you know that that's where a lot of the, the problems can sh can can come up. So courses that maybe did fairway top dressing. I'm sure they're all perfect, but yeah. if you got a little thatch, especially in teas, when you're constantly fertilizing out all those divots, uh, we're seeing a lot of that isolated uh, problems yeah. to those uh, bank grass areas. So this is one, uh, this is work from uh, um, years ago. Bill, were you born at this time in 1991? Uh <laughs> I was four or five. <laughs> so this is work we did back in Purdue. This is a dormant seeding study, but the only reason I wanted to put this on here is we looked at tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, and perennial ryegrass seeded the first of each month throughout the winter. And then this is data, uh, turf cover in terms of July. And the yellow bar is the bluegrass. And you can see it seeding in March by July. Again, we didn't do anything aggressive. This was lawn height turf, but it's, it's an example. We had 50% cover not doing anything. You wait a month, uh, it's 30% cover. You wait two months, it's almost nothing, you know, down below 10%. So what Bill and I are going to say all day long today is seed yesterday if you can, because mm -hmm. getting it in the ground, uh, in many cases, it might still be a dormant seeding depending on the weather that's coming up. It absorbs moisture. It's ready to go as soon as the soil temperatures start to warm up. And especially with something like Kentucky bluegrass, that could save you yeah. 10, 14 days. Yeah. And that's a huge, that's, that's a huge difference. So one of the take home messages do it now. Seed as soon as you can. I can't believe how high this de December seed is. Yeah, it's, uh, that was again, that was in Indiana. That, yeah. uh, that uh, uh, And that was two years worth of data. It's as good as it was in September. Yep. So, yep. Cool. but yeah, that's the, obviously the take home. So when it came to seeding greens, if we have greens damage, uh, we did this after 14 and then we did it again in 2015. So this is the data from 2014. We did this up at the uh, University of Nebraska Research Green where we either cut in seed um, or we didn't. And then we had different covers and different fertility uh, treatments to see which ones recovered the fastest. So just with the seed, we cut it in. We had a, a tri-wave um, seeder uh, and it made nice little uh, slits to cut in. And after six weeks, we, if we didn't seed, we still had problems. Uh, after six weeks with the seeding, uh, obviously, there's some natural regrowth going on there, but we also were getting some nice fill in those uh, grooves uh, because of how the research was set up. It was really impractical to go in multiple directions. I wouldn't do two pounds per thousand in, in one cut anymore. I'd probably try to do it in three directions and maybe do a half pound each time it would be the better way of doing it if I'm doing a, a cedar like this. But anything you can do to disrupt that surface is going to be really important instead of just flinging seed and hoping that it's sitting in the in the soil, but it's really just caught in that thatch, yeah. dead, that dead grass uh, debris. Uh, one thing I would probably do too is would you, you know, would you scalp down the dead stuff? Yeah, I, you know, I probably, uh, I probably weren't, wouldn't. Uh, probably two reasons because uh, it's a pain in the butt yeah it's the first reason and then what do you do with all that dead stuff yeah it's and then and secondly you don't know how much 
of that is still alive. Well, maybe so, don't scalp it. Maybe we just do like, so like I let my greens grow up to like 180 last year. So yeah, I brought okay, them down okay. to like 120. Okay. So yeah. at least I'm getting some yeah. of the dead stuff out yeah. of there, right? So yeah. and again, anything that you can make it easier for the 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 seed to get down in the soil, I'm in, fa I'm in favor of. And again, we're just trying to get seed down in the soil, seed soil, soil contact, keep that seed moist. Easier on the irrigation system makes for way better survival. And Matt Soshek, our was our research manager at the University of Nebraska, and worked with us. He was saying that a tri we triway really helped. Uh, half the depth, no problems. You know, it was really clean. We could seed it, we could roll it, and you barely knew you yep. did anything afterwards. Great, great machine. Yep. So reseeding, uh, soil prep, anything to improve seed to soil contact. And if you're thinking outside of greens, uh, recent study that, that Matt and uh, Zach did before I was there, looking at some different seeding methods. Yeah, and, and really it didn't make much difference. Just get it, uh, I think Bill's got a slide of it, but just get it in the ground. Get it as, 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 and we've all seeded before, so we all know anything you do is get it down into that soil. That soil is what's providing the moisture uh until that that seed starts to root and so anything you can do to get it down there uh it, it's it's money ahead yeah i mean this is it's you know you can have it in little little uh centers if you did the uh airification, airification yeah. or we cut it in or we just fling the seed and run a power rake over it yep. that did, i said a lot for me i had a lot of dog damage yeah it's amazing you would just throw the seed down and then you think you're gonna like damage it with that yeah. power rake but it presses it right in and, and you get a great catch out of it yeah, any, anything you can do to get down in the soil, again, money ahead. Yep. And so this is this is some of the work that uh, or some of the data doesn't matter. If, again, this is tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, creeping bent grass wouldn't be any different. Uh, whether it's a drive wave or the power rake that we drop seeded or, or uh, aerified with the hollow tine and then follow with drop seeding, it really doesn't it really doesn't matter when it's all said and done. Just uh, make sure you disrupt the soil some in some way, shape or form. Yeah. And it did take a while, even in tall fescue. I mean, you didn't have hundred percent cover until 14, 16 weeks. Yeah, that's true. But again, the, the thing I was, this, this was lawn height yeah. and it wasn't, it wasn't, we didn't do intense management, the lower mowing, you know, uh, maybe spoon feeding fertilization. We didn't get after this was, this was really designed for lawn, uh, really designed under lawn height. Yep. So another thing we checked out was different ways of heating up the soil. So in 2014, we got the uh, the seed down in early uh, April, and then we had a, a period that was fairly sunny uh, and a little bit warmer. And so we checked out permeable covers um, from the white green jacket one you can see there. We did impermeable cover, which was just plastic with holes punched into it. We looked at uh, really high rates of a green turf pigment. Um, we tried the black weed cloth because I thought that would maybe help heat up the soil. Um, didn't quite work that way. And then we had our do nothing non-treated control. Um, so we looked at the temperature. Yeah, the germination raise radius with the plaster than the control. Uh, the weed barrier was actually the worst. And that's because those soils were the coldest because it was actually shading. It, it didn't let this going on there. So we need that sun to get through the car, the, the cover to warm up that, that soil and then trap that. But nothing statistical. Um, didn't really see a huge increase in the temperature. But, but go back to that. Yeah. When, you, when you did this, so that, that makes a huge on any given day. You know, right now it's overcast here in, in Lincoln. Not going to be a difference. Amongst exactly. Amongst so that's the thing. So this is in 2014. Yeah. It was a rainy, cloudy three week period after we seeded. And so we were better off just doing nothing instead of putting these huge tarps down, figuring out the way to go. Oh, tarps. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, in 2014, looked at quality of germination, which we kind of said was, you know, how rolls uh, rows. Uh, and so the green jacket cover was the best. Uh, the, we had really nice rows. They, they really matured well. Um, of seedlings, permeable cover, let the water be more uniformly distributed underneath the cover. Where if we use that plastic, it got warmer, but a lot of the seed was just isolated to where we punctured those eight. Um, you know, by the end of, of, uh, of May, they all were really good. You know, we had good recovery, but if you're trying to help, but again, if we don't have a very sunny spring, then we don't see much of this early season benefit from the covers. And obviously, that fairway or anything like that, or, no. or some kind of small area. But those those covers, they're, they are they're a pain. They're a pain, and they're, they're pricey, but they're really a pain yeah. in the butt. Yeah, hold the moisture. Uh, it might it'll it would keep golfers off it. It would keep carts off it. And so there is there there's some maybe not agronomic benefits to it. There, yeah, yeah. It could, if you got them, I don't <laughs> think I'd go out and buy uh, a couple areas that are really yeah. small. Yep. And I'll, let's see if there's any regrowth there. So maybe I'll cover like roll-offs or really high value areas like outside of the green or energy with that. 
Finally, the fertility, we did zero, a tenth of a pound every two weeks or half a pound every two weeks. And there was no difference between the tenth of a pound and five tenths of a pound of N. So uh, don't get too, it just starts to accumulate in the soil. And then we get natch. All that tissue there that is dead is going to release fertilizer in the summer. So now you got extra fertilizer there on top of dead tissue that's going to release more fertilizer through mineralization. And we're going to have a lot of growth then, which gets really puffy and thatchy. Now you're fighting green speeds and pain levels of nitrogen. Uh, just like spoon feeding through that period will help. Get a starter fertilizer down uh, with the seedlings, uh, maybe make a second up. Uh, that will supply enough phosphorus for those seedlings to uh, to germinate. But in terms of nitrogen, don't go too crazy. Yeah, and, and then fertilizer availability uh, might be easier said than done. Yeah, yeah. phosphorus is important. Uh, if you can get down half a pound, be, uh, be beneficial for the for uh, the seedlings. A tenth of a pound of nitrogen. Yep, yeah. should be good. So let's talk a little. So, again, this depends on what kind of what area you're wor you're working on, uh, whether it's green or a fairway. And so uh, I wouldn't use uh, I wouldn't use any of the barricades of the world, pendomethylins, uh, things like that. I just would not use those. Uh, I'm a fan of tenacity, even though it's not a bare product. It's a syngenta product, one of my favorite herbicides uh, of all times because you can use it in a seed bed. Uh, in a relatively bare seed bed, it'll probably give you four to six weeks of control uh, of crabgrass and poa. Uh, and so that, and, and plus now, uh, with the Anderson's comes on a, on a, on a starter fertilizer. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so it's, it's really a, it for, for seeding, it really is a, it really is a great herbicide. Again, it's, it's not going to stand up as a pre-emergent herbicide like dimension or barricade or, or, uh, pendomethylin, but for seeding, it's fabulous. And I'm not sure if anybody uses 2% anymore. Yeah, I guess I'm, not even my shop. I'm not even sure it's still available, but I don't think it is. It, yeah. yeah, it's probably good. Tenacity is a far better product. And so, uh, so I would do, I would use, uh, if I was, if I was creating a program for somebody, if I was doing it uh, on my golf course today, I would put, uh, I would apply tenacity uh, uh, on uh, in the seed bed. Obviously, you won't want to do that uh, if you're if you're trying to seed creeping bent grass, or if you're trying to seed let poa come back because it's going to control both of those. Uh, thanks for pointing pointing that out, Matt. But uh, uh, and so I would put that down now as you seed or immediately after you seed, uh, or when about when you're expecting germination, maybe is a good way of saying it. If it's bluegrass or ryegrass, and then I would probably make it another application of that tenacity again probably four to six weeks after the initial application. And that will go a long way to controlling uh, uh, crabgrass. It'll control annual bluegrass too, uh, if you're trying to keep that, so keep it as clear. So should we can. do that about four weeks after we seed or after emergence? What's a better, how should we time that for seeding yeah, safety? Yeah, the hard thing. So if I would seed today, Bill, I mean, it's almost a dormant seeding. And so yeah. it's almost, I would, I would almost apply this tenacity as you get closer to emergence, you know, if you're seeding when the soil temperature is adequate to, you know, 55, 60 degrees where that, that seed's gonna pop, I would apply it that day. Mm -hmm. If it's, if, if you're basically dormant seeding, I would wait a couple more weeks afterwards until that you get closer, just so you get a longer window of control. Okay. And then I would, and then I would make that next application uh, again, four to six weeks after the initial. Okay. So, and check the label. Uh, I'm probably taking some liberties on that. I don't have the, the label memorized anymore. Uh, and so, um, and so you can make, you can come back with tenacity four to six weeks after the initial uh, dimension is pretty safe. And so that would be a great crabgrass product. Not so good on POA, but a good crabgrass product. Not so good for controlling POA. I mean, it's safe on POA, don't get me wrong. Uh, and uh, and its label says apply after at least two mowings, whatever that means. And so now being on this side of the table, there's a lot of, of statements like that are pretty loosey-goosey statements, but you guys have to use your, uh, let your conscience be your guide on that. Uh, and then Ronstar, if you have goosegrass as an issue, it would have to be Ronstar on FERT. And just check the label because each one of those uh, fertilizer products might be slightly different. And so uh, if I, if someone was pushing me and they had a really heavy poa infestation or an area with heavy crabgrass or goosegrass, I would probably be a smidge more aggressive with the herbicides. Even though you might suffer a little bit of damage on the bluegrass or the ryegrass or the bentgrass, that stuff will recover but if it's being outcompeted, it will never, it'll never recover. And we have time, right? Because a lot yeah. of times we talk about 55 degrees soil tests or soil temperature for that app, but 
it could probably be a little later. So if you need that extra time, know that yep. you can, especially with dimension, which you get some posts from when, yep. when it's really small. I mean, general recommendation to homeowners in say Nebraska and Eastern Nebraska is just get it down by early May. Yeah. Generally pretty good. Yeah. So give yourself some time to make sure you really understand what your damage level looks like. Yep. If you need to see, give your seedlings a chance to start growing before you come out with this, uh, these types of products. So, yeah. And, uh, and again, if it's tenacity, uh, uh, I'm a fan of tenacity, at least two applications. Dimension has the best safety of the pre's, so that can come in after at least two mowings. And then in terms of post control, if you choose to go only pro post, uh, you can uh, drive, uh, drive accelerate, uh, it'll pick up crabgrass and some broad leaves. That's really safe. Uh, on turf, 28 days after emergence of what it says on the label. Uh, a claim will pick up crabgrass as well as goosegrass. And if you have foxtails, uh, that depending on the species, you can apply it again, four weeks or 28 days after emergence or, uh, uh, or up to three months on Kentucky bluegrass. And then quicksilver is always my favorite when it comes to uh, seeding, weed control and seeding, because it's so dang safe. Uh, you can apply it seven days after emergence uh, to pick up all the, the, the variety of, of, uh, uh, of young oddlies coming in there. And again, I tend to be uh, more aggressive with herbicides than what the label might suggest when it comes to reestablishment, just because if you don't do something, those weeds are gonna are gonna destroy your stand. Yeah. And again, we have a question here about no pre-emerging if promote if trying to get bent and polar, right? So yep. we don't have any options there. Uh, yep. I know that's a challenge for me because I have uh, both goose and crabgrass in my greens so fortunately the greens are okay from tank watering and things like that top dressing um but unfortunately we don't have a lot of options if we're getting that bent grass in um for yeah. those for, for pre on that control so one of the questions we missed that we missed this question before but uh what about verticutting for uh to prepare a seed bed to bring up poa to bring up the seed bank as opposed to hollow time you think it's deep enough i think it's well to so bring up seed so uh it might be so a grading might be deep enough. I don't yeah. think a bird. So uh, the vast majority of poa seed is only in the top half an inch, uh, and so you don't need to go very low, but you have to bring up that soil. I don't. I don't think a verticut unit is going to bring up. Yeah, I think the, the soil bog down. Probably. Yeah, yeah, I think they would. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's going to bring up enough soil. So I'd probably go with an airification. A grading would do it. Uh, but that's a pain in the butt too. And you so probably don't have to go that deep, right? I mean, yeah, you, no. could, you could set your pro core or whatever to a maybe a three quarter. Right? You could, With you your... could, yeah, you could pull it up and then drag it back in. If it, and if it's only a half inch deep, uh, you don't have that much that much crap to get rid of. You know, the drag, and so you could drag it around. You drag it, yeah. yeah. So, yep. All right. This is in uh, actually a course here in Lincoln, and uh, this was the worst time they could see perennial ryegrass late in the fall. I don't know. It was probably middle of October, end of October, and there's absolutely no, what kind of phones are those? Is that like a, uh, it's a Motorola? It's a, no, it's it's a Blackberry. A, it's a Blackberry. It's a Motorola. Motorola. Yeah, it's a Blackberry. That's a Blackberry. That's what this was hit, man. I yeah. had a Blackberry at one time, so that dates me. And so, but no POA control. There's ryegrass in there, believe it or not, but there's no POA. But then if you take a look at the next, next picture, uh, and you can see this is right uh, at the point where uh, he did not spray tenacity, but you can see it's almost a pure stand of perennial ryegrass. And so, uh, you, you got to you got to do something. Have to do something when it comes to herbicides, or you'll the stand will just get dominated, mm -hmm. absolutely dominated. Yep. There are question about the uh, the pro core comment before. What spacings, uh, time size? I mean, it's just I think it's just more more surface area, right? So if you could do smaller times in two directions, that might be more just speed up or yeah. So uh, I guess two two things. If I'm looking, uh, you're probably looking at uh, trying to disturb the most soil. Yeah. And so shallow and tight, shallow holes, tight spacing would not only bring up a good chunk of POA seed, it would also maximize the amount of area for, yeah. for seed soil exactly. contact. So yeah, I would just do what you can. Our friend uh, Craig Ferguson said, if you flip the vertical blades backwards, 
they make a deep trench. Yeah. And I guess if you drive backwards too, Fergie, that might help too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, I, I, I'll stick with the air. I'll stick with the airification. I'll let you guys do the modifications of the equipment. Yeah. We, Greg Ferguson is the uh, modification master of equipment. Yeah. So. The University of Nebraska. Yeah. And so here's, here's just another, again, some of this uh, older work that we did. And this is again, Kentucky bluegrass definitely slow to germinate. And uh, this is Kentucky bluegrass cover uh six weeks after emergence and so this would have been spring treatments and we did a bunch of tenacity drive quicksilver and so on and uh if we apply to that seedling we got pretty good cover we got uh pretty good control uh, this is kentucky bluegrass cover uh if we applied it zero weeks after emergence again using something like tenacity we're up 75 80 percent cover even two weeks after emergence when we applied tenacity uh we're still at 65 percent cover but if we did nothing, we only had 21% Kentucky bluegrass cover. So again, you have to do something to keep the crabgrass, the poa, if you want to keep it controlled, uh, down. And just the opposite, this is now crabgrass cover, uh, untreated check. You can see we had 60% untreated check, again, six weeks after emergence, whereas the good herbicide treatments had 10% or less. So. Bottom line is you got to do something with uh, with the herbicides. I mean, it had two percent in there. Yeah, it must have been old data. And this is one more thing. Uh, this is what did out at Lockman when Craig Ferguson was the superintendent. And here we were using various ryegrass, bluegrass ratios. Uh, this was a fall seeding, but then we came back over the top with an untreated check, no herbicide, uh, or we used tenacity three times applied starting two weeks after emergence, or even progress applied uh, starting two weeks after emergence. And so uh, the green is the good, uh, the yellow is the bad POA in this case, no POA treatment, 100% Kentucky bluegrass. We had almost 100% POA annua when we rated it in the following May. Whereas with tenacity or progress, we're looking at 35% cover, even 75% cover, as long as we intervened with uh, herbicides. And then when you go to perennial rot percent perennial ryegrass, as you might imagine, it germinated faster. And herbicides weren't quite as important, but even still, 50% with no herbicides. Uh, you put tenacity down, we have 90% cover, progress down, you got 100% cover by the following May. So bottom line is you got to do, when you're seeding, you got to do something with the weeds. So what about from the nurse crop perspective, from this, and you just have percent turf, if you want to go bluegrass in the spring, does it make sense to include a rye or if it's hard to find maybe a fine fescue or something to be that nurse crop or you think it's not as important? Yeah, you know, I uh, I kind of like, I I don't have much experience with the nurse crop in a couple of courses. Uh, I don't mind the fine fescue in there uh, at all, especially when it's creeping vent grass. It, yeah. it blends in pretty well. Uh, if you can get it, again, at this point, try to keep it simple, stupid would be my take, but green is good. Yeah. And so if you can get, get a hold of fine fescue and it's it, the price is right, uh, it will certainly help. But I think in the bluegrass scenario, it might make in more sense. Right. But yeah. if you're doing bent anyways, I mean, we know some of Devin Carroll's research from Penn State. She showed that there's still big differences in germination across the bent grasses, yeah. but um, it still germinates a lot faster than the bluegrass. So yeah. if, if the nurse crop is going to pop up one or two days sooner, does it really have right. an advantage. I don't, I don't know as much, yeah. but for the blue in this scenario, maybe it, it does. Yeah. But again, I, I'm going to kind I'm going to contradict myself, which is always good, but you know, all of this stuff is done with almost no traffic and we apologize for that. You know, this, this is, this is on a, a practice range over Lachlan. Uh, but if, if, if you have traffic on the fairway, that nurse grass could only help the bluegrass or the bent grass. Yeah. It could only help. Yeah. Because we don't care if the nurse grass gets beaten up, and so you know that's not a, that's not a bad idea, Bill, is to go in with you know, with a fine fescue nurse grass at the same time as you're trying to seed uh, Kentucky bluegrass or creeping bent grass. Yeah. All right. All right. Take homes again. No typical pre-emergent herbicides. Uh, tenacity in the seed bed, and then I would split it. Uh, is this an extra slide? I think it would be. Repeat the same yeah, slide. Yep. Yep. Oh, right. no, here's some more oh, stuff. Okay, Stu. I uh, added some stuff. And so <laughs> uh, for the post, again, we have drive, we have a claim, we have quicksilver for broadleaves, progress for POA, tenacity for POA. Look at the labels. If you're trying, if you're trying to uh, uh, seed ryegrass or Kentucky bluegrass, 
or bent grass and minimize the POA, prograss or tenacity makes a lot of sense. Obviously, not no tenacity in, in a bent grass stand. Yeah. So intervene with herbicides. Then the so the other thing, especially you know, is, uh, I don't know how many guys we have from the east, but you guys uh, have issues primarily on your greens, from what I understand. And at this time of the year, uh, especially with annual bluegrass greens, uh, fifty-five degrees soil temperature is go time. And so, uh, even though we might be receding, we we'll probably do have a lot of annual bluegrass coming back. And so, you're still going to have to do something. And so, what we've always said. Uh, you know, 55, 60 deg 65 degrees picks up all of these diseases, uh, and especially when you're using a DMI, which remains the most effective uh, fungicide that we have for these guys, uh, other than for pythium root, root, root rot, that's obviously a different uh, mode of action required. But DMIs, two applications at 28 days apart are still going to be important. And so you're going to pick up, you know, your fairy ring, your summer patch, anthracnose, Whitea brown ring and the brown ring. Uh, and so don't forget about that if you're receding the greens. And so uh, there is some concern about the DMIs. I know uh, Steve McDonald had a great letter that he sent out to uh, the guys on the East Coast. And Steve does great work out of, out of Philadelphia. Um, and he mentioned some of the issues with DMI fungicides where they can be growth regulating, which I agree 100%. So I would avoid applying those. The good thing is that we now have a couple of products that are uh, that don't have as much growth regulation. So this is stuff that Bill did uh, last year. I'm showing Bill's data. You want to talk about it, Bill? You want me to do it? You can talk about it. <laughs> so this is so if you if I if I if I go up, let me go up. Can I go up here? I think so. Okay. So uh, what we do? We applied uh, DMIs twice during the summer on two different plots, and then took clippings throughout and uh, based that on on growing degree days, trying to see how they regulated and when then when they rebounded. And you can see here. Uh, the older products, Banner, Bailaton, Tebby, things like that. Uh, we had up to uh, 40% uh, relative clipping yield, 40% uh, reduction at its peak at about 200 growing degree days. So up here, that was probably about... Well, in May, in the May period, we're making this application yep. in April, May, that's a... That's about that's 14 days or better, I bet. That's about 20, it's like 18 days. Yeah, okay. So you're getting 18 days to peak suppression with these products. Uh, and this was done on, on creeping bent grass fairways. Uh, but again, these class B, these DMIs are essentially class yep. B PGRs. Yep. So you're going to get some suppression out and, of some and, of these. And you might not get it as bad on a new seedling, but it doesn't matter. You don't want to risk it. Yep. And anything that is alive, you don't want to risk it. And so then you get the rebound uh, shortly thereafter. But the new, the new products, the new product, uh, BASF's uh, Max Team, as well as our Densacore, uh, we don't have nearly the rebound or nearly the growth regulation that we did with the older products. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I love the DMIs for such great disease control, again, anthracnose, summer patch, fair ring, and so on. And now we have safe enough products where they're not going to do uh, not going to do a number yeah. on the. And one of the things that for this, I can, if you're a Greenkeeper app user, we just released this new feature that shows the amount of suppression from these products. So if you're curious about your different DMIs, you can put them in there and see which one would give you different amounts of suppression and how long it will last. So uh, you can you can see that in our app too. But just being really aware of this, they're an important application because they are really devastating diseases in the yep. summertime if we don't hit these apps. So it's just being aware that these products might hinder some of that. Uh, recovery and so there's other options in the DMIs that might be less intrusive to those seedlings. Yep. So take home message: seed as soon as you can. As soon as you can get seed in the ground, seed, seed soil contact. Anything you can do doesn't matter which one you choose. Anything you can do to improve seed soil contact. Covers can help. I would high value areas. High if you value have areas them, if you have keep them. golfers off. Yeah, keep yeah keep golfers and traffic off. Uh, herbicides certainly going to be needed. Avoid the growth regulators and make sure you still use the fungicides uh, where necessary on the greens. And so cultural practices, a little bit of fertilizer goes a long way. Make sure you keep the uh, uh, a starter fertilizer. That would have been 50 pounds per acre. And you could even probably split that. You could. Yep. So if you did, yep. if you wanted to do two apps, you probably did 25 pounds yep. per acre yep. uh, twice. Yep. Yeah, that, that is, no, it should be 0.5 pounds per, per thousand. thousand. Who wrote that? I don't, it's these are your slides. No, you had some spelling mirrors too. Well, so, okay. okay. And again, easy for us to say, stay off the turf, 
easy for us to say it's going to that's that's a battle that everybody's going to have to have. Um, so with that, that's all we have. Uh, what you have there is our our phone numbers. Uh, if you want to give us a buzz, we're happy to uh, tackle individual questions. If you want to send us a text, uh, that's a good way to contact us too. Yeah. Uh, any other questions that we have over here, Bill? We've got three new Let's messages. See, we got a couple more here. Let's see. Wouldn't fall dormant seating be a good insurance policy for any possible spring dead turf? Yes, it would, but it could be expensive. So that's, uh, I guess I would rather wait uh, until you see what the winter weather is doing. Yeah. I guess I would rather, uh, rather than reseeding all the time, I'd probably change my winter watering you if think it's I a would, desiccation area. Well, and the thing that I wonder too is if you have a winter, like we were really dry in the fall here in Nebraska, and then we were very dry through the winter. So are we still seeing, you think, the benefits on a winter in which the soil is dust from a, or can we just still do it with like a February or March seeding? Yeah. I mean, again, it's just the sooner you can get it into the soil, the better. So they can start taking up water when it's available and that cold can start, you know, helping yep. fracture that seed coat uh, and get that thing going. So um, there's not much, even though that, that table or the graph that I showed had a pretty significant difference between uh, December and March. That was a pretty, it was a, a pretty late March seeding. Mm -hmm. pretty, the seeding was March 1st, but it was a late spring green up. And so uh, uh, I think it, the sooner you get the, the, the turf and the, the seed in the ground, uh, the better off we'll all be. Let it absorb the water. And then right when it's ready to pop, when it's ready to warm up. Yep. Some other little things that you can do uh, to maybe help get things going. Um, nitrate based fertilizers can help trigger a little bit of an earlier green up. Um, so that is something that if you could find some potassium nitrate, you don't have to go high rates, even low levels. So nitrate, the fertilizer, in addition to being a nutrient, is also a signal molecule for roots to help uh, initiate green up. Uh, and so uh, little bits of nitrate in the soil can go a long way to, uh, to, to help that plant realize its spring. Uh, again, though, if, if you are covering, uh, we had this problem, we did covers and, uh, it got too hot underneath there. The, green, the grass was very green. We pulled them off after a hot weekend when no one was up at the mead to pull them off. Uh, and uh, then it got really cold and we had a lot of damage. Yeah. So uh, you got to be kind of careful with those covers too. Ammonium sulfate, um, you know, the ammonium eventually is going to go to nitrate, uh, especially if the soils are wet. But um, the ammonium can get into the plant fairly quickly, but the nitrate would be the, the molecule that's both the signal and um, a, a source. I don't want to go crazy trying to find a nitrate product, but if there is a product on your shelf that has nitrate in it, it would be, uh, it could be helpful to uh, spoon feed a little bit of that into these areas. Then you only look at a tenth of a pound. Yeah, you don't need a lot. It's just yeah. to be there. It's, it's a signal molecule. It's not, a, you're not thinking about like a nutrient. It's just helping those roots get going. Yeah. And if you do, again, if going back to the pain in the butt of covers, if you're using covers, you're probably going to have to bump up the fungicide applications mm -hmm. uh, for microdochium, uh, uh, lactate microdochium and pink microdochium being the big one. Yeah. I mean, Paul Koch has got some good data that showed that from all, all winter long covers, but the same thing's happening where we're constantly watering the covers holding the humidity in there and it's not that bright uh, to kind of stop that disease progression. I mean, he'll see in Wisconsin, pink snow mold all the way through June yeah. in that climate. So it's not just a snow type disease uh, yeah. to be aware of that. So uh, next question is any thoughts on pre-germinated seed or is that dated? So I think uh, pre-germinated seed works really well on athletic fields when you're uh, in between games and you don't have time for it. You don't, don't have time for, you know, five days for the ryegrass to absorb seed and absorb water and start to germinate. And I think for Kentucky bluegrass, it makes a lot of sense, you know, on the scale of, a, of acres of turf on a golf course, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. Maybe, uh, uh, and you could do the same thing by seeding today, which again out here is probably three weeks before germination, if not longer, mm -hmm. and it would be just as, just as effective. And so, yeah, I think with the early seeding, understand that you're not necessarily going to see the, uh, the recovery, like you might be, okay, I'm going to seed now. Like you said, yeah. like in three weeks, something's going to happen, but stuff's happening in the ground so that when it does start to grow, yep. you're going to get a faster pop out of it. Your, your germination, you're saving, you're saving time. Uh -huh. You're saving germination time. That window of germination or that period of germination 
it still takes 21 days after it absorbs the water. And so it absorbs the water in, you know, today, you know, if it'd be sunny and 55 degrees out, it would be absorbing water and starting to kick in, but you still won't see germination for 10 days, assuming. Yeah, and this is that ner nerdy hormone uh, hormone thing, but there's, there, you know, there's <laughs> hormones, that. there's ABA, there's a hormone ABA in the seed coat that have to actually has to be leached out. And so that moisture allows that hormone to be leached out into the soil. And when that hormone is gone, then it starts making gibberellin, the hormone to make it grow. And so um, that's why getting it in the ground with that moisture is letting that hormone diffuse out of the seed so that it can start breaking uh, once the soil temperatures are warm enough for that cotyledon to start to grow. Yeah. So the next question is, uh, Poa bent greens, Poa is starting to turn yellow, almost looks like anthracnose. Any thoughts? So um, if it looks like anthracnose, it might be a little bit early for the ace cervulae. Uh, it, there's a good chance it's just probably a weather thing. If you've had uh, cold fronts blow through, I think you, you, I mean, here in Lincoln, it was 80 degrees and, uh, on Saturday. and and it's, you know, yesterday I was lucky to get to 30. So that, that it might be a weather thing. Uh, just get down there and look to see if you need see any lesions. Yeah, see any, patch, really? yeah, yeah you, it, it, it would be yellow patch, but those usually form. Uh, Maybe it's a small ring. Yeah. It's still growing. And if it is yellow patch, it's no big deal. It's not going to cause any problems. Yeah. We have some um, spots I was on the greens this morning at Egger and uh, you just, you know, some of those, those, Bent grass patches just really settled down. If you look at it, the greens, the leaves are purple. Oh yeah, and that's a, the that's cold. a like whole anthocyanin response. Yeah. But it looks like it's a sunken dead patch. So it could be a couple of different things. It could, most likely is, is abiotic, uh, not a disease, but it, it could be. And you know, if you're really concerned about it, it's widespread. It, it would be worth sending a sample and everything. Yeah, you can and, send um, a sample. And, and in in reality, uh, you know, I can say this because I work for a, a fungicide company. You know, treating for either anthracnose or even yellow patch now, if you use a DMI, uh, you'd water that in, and that would really suffice, depending on your soil temperatures, for an early fairy ring summer patch app. So Dwayne's asking her more about proxy and a new program in the Northwest for his POA greens. I mean, the proxy, I don't think, should really be a problem for the seedlings, right? I mean, well, the, the proxy, again, not, if, not, you, not if they just emerge, I wouldn't. Yeah, if, you have, if you have, if you're, if you're at almost 100% cover or even 80% cover, then I probably would go with the proxy. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, yeah, that's, uh, unfortunately for you guys, it takes about five applications one in the fall and then starting up again uh, almost monthly in February, March, April, and May, you know, give or take 200 growing degree days between, I think that's what you use. Yeah. Which is about use. three weeks. Yeah. Depending on the temperatures. temperatures yeah. And so, uh, and then uh, when do you switch uh, See, I don't, to a new? I like to do my first app with just the proxy right. because I'm going to get, 10%. I'll get 10% suppression on proxy. And then the new is going to give you 25, 30% suppression. Primo is around 20%. Of growth. Of, of growth. growth. Of growth. Of vertical growth. Yeah. So, if my vertical growth is still really low, then I'm not going to go with the new. I'm only going to go with the new or a primo with the proxy when I'm actually starting to see growth um, to, you know, maybe further suppress that growth. And if you're uncomfortable with it, just stick with the proxy for those couple yep. apps. I wouldn't, if you think the growth rate's too slow and you don't want to do the PGR, that's fine. Uh, you know, we're using that PGR really to minimize the, the risk of potential crown rising, which, you know, I haven't really ever seen in Nebraska. I've, I've heard reports of in the East Coast. Um, but I haven't really ever seen it. So if you're worried about mixing it, then just stick with the proxy apps. Um, and if you are seeding, I wouldn't do the proxy right after the seedling is germinated. But, it, you know, if it's yeah. ahead, of, ahead of time, that can be helpful yeah. too. It just depends how much area you're reseeding. Yeah, exactly. Let's see. Uh, wrong mice, wrong mouse. That should, uh, that should do it. Uh, and we're at uh, 1255 local time, 155 on the East Coast. And Lord knows what time it is in uh, 1055 off the PNW for Dwayne, I guess. Yeah. So, um, uh, folks, again, if we can help, let us know. Uh, everybody's got a different situation and it's hard to create a recipe. Hopefully you got some uh, some take home messages. Uh, and if, if we can help, you know, if you need help with a board of directors or, sure. you know, one of the more problematic uh, folks on your board, uh, uh, give us a text, send yeah. us or call us. Uh, we'd be happy to do what we can do. Yeah, we're just happy to do this. And we did all this research and we just want to share it with yep. everybody. We all feel for everyone dealing with this right now. If you have, you want to reach out to me too, 
My email is simple. It's just bill at greenkeeperapp.com. So you can easy to remember. Uh, and then I'm at you or excuse me, at PGR bill on Twitter. <laughs> so if you are uh, on reach through Twitter, um, you can reach you that way also. Otherwise, you know, text or call. And uh, we thank everybody for joining us. Uh, we'll post this online. So if you need to see it again or and share it with anybody. Post it on the Greenkeeper app Yeah, page. I'll put it on the, the Greenkeeper YouTube page. And then I'll also embed it in the greenkeeper.blog, our blog site. So okay. it'll be both there. And I'm sure I'll put it on, on Twitter to help get people to those locations. So uh, thanks very much, everybody. Great. Thanks, everybody.